Got a Samsung SB5000. This is a multi-system converting VCR that the client says would not eject the tape and he had to take it apart and wind the tape out manually. Sounds like a mode switch problem to me. That's what I think it is before going in. Let's check it out. It might even work, but it's going to be the mode switch. So let's uh, get started on this one and get it back in service. I'm working on a Samsung SV5000. This is a triple system, PAL, CCAM, and NTSC, and also do PAL M and PAL N conversion machine. It was brought in to uh, be serviced. It appears to, uh, from what I've been told, it has a loading problem. So let's just pull it apart and see what's happening with the loading mechanism. If you guys notice anything different with the sound, I'm using my uh, uh, FDR AX53 again. This one tends to uh, have a really sensitive microphone as I move from side to side. It really tends to it really tends to move the audio back and forth, and there's not really any way I don't think to to solve this problem other than going to an external mic, which I may have to do if this one keeps doing this. I may have to go to an external microphone. Anyway, let's uh, see what this one does. Uh, we'll observe what it does when it tries to load the tape up. And then eject. It doesn't seem like the tape is dropped properly. So it seems like it doesn't seem like the tape's down all the way. Okay, what I want to do on this one, the first thing I want to do on this is I want to do the mode switch because uh, mode switches are really the most common problem on all video recorders is the mode switch. So to get at the mode switch, yes, I believe I have to just lift the chassis out. Many VCRs, they put screws in the bottom on the circuit board, requiring you, I haven't opened one of these things up in a while, so I forget. So that's why I'm pulling the bottom cover off. To hold it in place, looks like they were. There we go. Okay, um, here's our mode switch. And mode switches cause the vast majority of intermittent problems on these units where they won't uh, eject or do weird things. We'll note the position of the mode switch. The arrow is pointing to the fully eject position. 
and you usually can just pop them open like that. And as you can see, this one here looks like it's in need of cleaning. There's a fair bit of, of dirt and so forth. As you can see, I haven't even put any cleaner on here yet. It's pretty dungy. A little better. We'll get some. We'll get some uh, deoxid in there in a minute to wipe out the old stuff first. We're going to use deoxid D100. This is 100%. The oxid solution. We'll apply some right to the surface of the contacts and using a little bit of action from the applicator just give it a bit of a, a scrape there. This will help penetrate through oxidation layers and allow the cleaner to get in and clean it. Then we'll take a new Q-tip and wipe it out. And we got that amount of dirt. It was still remaining. There's the other the other side here. So there was a fair bit of oxidation in there. We're also going to do the uh, other contacts here. Yeah, look what came off the switch, right? Just gunge. And what happens on these is the switch, uh, the contacts get uh, dirty and uh, they make intermittent electrical contact. And this is what signals the microprocessor as to what the machine is doing. So if you don't have a good reliable connection then uh, you'll end up with intermittent signals and intermittent signals will cause all kinds of problems number one fault on any VCR is a contaminated or oxidated mode encoder switch so whenever you have any faults that uh, especially if they fault and then they appear to clear themselves up because a lot of times if a machine's been sitting around for a while you get a lot of oxidation and uh, you'll operate the machine and it'll do weird things and then all of a sudden it appears to be working and it might work for a week, it might work for a month, it might work for a day and if you keep using it, it might even continue to work but it will act up again so when you get one machines that are doing weird things it's always best to open up the encoder switch and clean the contacts and add a little more spring to them as well just to make sure that we've got a good connection and now I'll just operate the switch this will polish the contacts and then we'll put the machine back together so I'll line up the arrows that way I know that it's lined up with the main cam gear as it's going to fit into this hole on this main side cam. How this one operates, it's got a loading motor. The loading motor here turns one of the primary gears that turns 
the loading mechanism cam gear. This is the gear that actually raises and lowers the mechanism. That gear in turn turns this other sub uh, gear. So it's a, not a cam gear. This is just a. It's it's almost like a a, a pin, like a like a. Uh, so I would say it's a pinion gear, but it's it's a it's a midway gear is what it is. It transfers power from this vertical turning uh, gear to a horizontal turning gear. So it's a midway gear one. Uh, this is midway gear two that operates the main cam. So this would be called the main cam gear. Uh, this operates this metal slide cam, which of course operates everything else. It operates the loading arms over here and also operates the, the mechanism as far as releasing and, and uh, applying the brakes for the tape hubs. So fairly simple mechanism, fairly reliable these ones. There really wasn't a heck of a lot that went wrong with these mechanisms. They are actually probably one of the more reliable of the uh, late model VCRs. I say VCRs got to be very uh, simplistic in the later years and the reliability went way up. But one thing that didn't go up in reliability was those bloody mode switches. Mode switches never went up in reliability. They uh, were always crap because they'd get dirty. And a dirty mode switch is going to cause the majority of problems with VCRs. And the best thing you can do to maintain a VCR, believe it or not, is use it. If you've got a VCR, even if, even if you're not using your VCR on a regular basis, if you put a tape into it, maybe once a month, run it through all its paces. Play, fast forward, rewind, forward search, reverse search, eject. Even if, even if you don't have a TV hooked up to it, just put a tape in, go through all the modes once or twice, and then shut it off. That'll keep things, it'll keep moving parts lubricated. It'll keep that mode switch from getting too dirty because the action of the switch contacts moving will keep it clean and it'll increase the reliability of the machine so that when you do need it, it's going to work. And I realize that people these days don't use VCR as much at all. Some people, they're kind of coming back. They like the retro stuff. For others, they use them as a business for archiving tapes. And, I mean, that's basically all I use my machines for. And that's what this machine is. This is that archiving machine. It's owned by a company that archives um, tapes. So it's going to pop the front back on it, and then we'll test the machine. I bet it's going to work properly. Even though when I did try it, it did appear to work, except for the, the cassette didn't appear to be loaded properly, but that might have been just that tape. But from the description I got from the owner of it, where he had to actually remove the tape manually and help it out because it wouldn't uh, eject, that's screaming mode switch all over. So let's try this out now and see what it does. And we have to tell it what's, what Stay mode it's in. There we go, NTSC. The and there it is. A uh, bit of a tracking problem here. I give the heads a clean. No, I'm not cleaning the video heads, I'm cleaning the lower the lower drum. I'm turning the heads out of the way so that I don't get the uh, K 
Q-tip anywhere near the heads. Do the upper portion of the drum, but not the heads. The heads I'll use a piece of paper for that. piece of just regular copy paper soaked in isopropyl alcohol and that cleans off the heads quite nicely. Picture's good. There we go. I have a feeling that this one's fine now. Let's go through the different modes. Let's do a forward search. Reverse search. And we'll go to full fast forward. Rewind. Back to play. Products. Let me tell you. I'm going to put in my other full length tape because this is a short one. So I have a full length tape here that I can play of my content back from the days when I used to do conversions. And I used to do uh, conversions using an AGW1. AGW1. AG stands for absolute garbage. That's my feeling of any any of the so-called Proline uh, VCRs that Panasonic made. The uh, all the AG was absolute garbage because uh, they all like they all failed. My AGW one died. My business partner's AGW1 died. My AG19, it's 1980 or 1970, I had one of them. I think in 1980, it blew up. My business partner, he had a 1970. His blew up. Capacitors everywhere, bad on those things. And uh, the little flex cables that were you, because you fold, you, you open down the front and it had like buttons on the front. The little flex cable, when it, for the whole front that, that, open and closed. Flex cable broke. It always broke. It was just terrible. Terrible design. Anyway, there's the picture on playback. Search forward. Back to play. And uh, now we can adjust the tracking on this. You probably got to use a remote control to adjust tracking on this thing, I think. But uh, anyway, it's it's working. It's working. It's looking okay. And when I eject the tape, the tape should eject, no problem. So that one's done. So I wish I had grabbed one of these machines myself. But me, as I say, I bought an absolute garbage Panasonic AGW-1 and spent a lot of money. That machine was... Uh, It was, it was thousands. It was like, I bought it in the States, and I think I paid 20, 2500 US dollars for it. The thing was like five grand here in Canada, which even 2500 US dollars when, when the dollar was, uh, we were talking at that time, probably about a 65 cent dollar, if, that, if not lower. So like it was, it was a lot of money, but it was still cheaper, a little bit cheaper to buy it out of the States. And I didn't, I don't think I ever made my money back on it. It was bought at the time just when the when the price for conversion started to figure out which one of these goes on here. Uh, it was right at the time there it goes when when the con price of conversions dropped. There was uh, a lot of Iowa machines that were cheap. 
little cheap Iowa machine showed up for like 500 bucks and it was it delivered inferior results to something like this or even the AGW one when it was working but um, the fact that everybody and his brother had one it dropped the price that we were getting for doing conversions used to we were used to get like oh it was ridiculous when we first started doing conversions it was we were making like 50 bucks an hour to transfer a tape and I think when I start, start, first started doing it, it was around 25 bucks an hour is what we were getting to transfer PAL and CCAM tapes. See, the advantage to the AGW1 is it could do CCAM. This one could only do ME CCAM, so it can't do the French system, whereas the AGW1 could. But um, this little cheap which I have one of them I have one of these Iowa machines it just does PAL to NCSC the built-in converter looks like crap see it says here um, France L not available it'll do CCAM for um, or, well here's the standards NTSC for Korea USA Canada Japan and Taiwan PAL BG for Germany Spain Western Europe PAL I for the UK and Hong Kong, and a DK format for China. The BG system of CCAM for Iran, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and uh, the DK format for Eastern Europe. Uh, CCAM L was not available. And then PAL, Brazil used PAL M, which was a, a different, slightly different version of PAL. It was, uh, and PAL N was also um, different. It was a pal. One of the two of them was 60 hertz. One of the one of the pals was uh, 525 lines. Like normally, pal and CCAM were 625 lines at uh, 50 hertz. NTSC is 525 at 60. And one of these two pals, I forget whether it was Argentina or Brazil. I never ever had a tape from either of those countries, but one of them uh, used a 525 line version and then there was NTSC 4.43 which is uh, and then ME CCAM was the Middle East CCAM which this one does I don't know if this one does it I think it just shuts the CCAM button because it is the CCAM on this is ME CCAM like all these other ones um, this version of CCAM Iran Egypt Saudi Arabia uh, they all are, are basically ME CCAM uh, France was the only one that was different because my AGW1 could do both. It had a button for CCAM, France, and it had another button for ME CCAM for the rest of them. But I did have PAL M and PAL N, and of course NTSC. And NTSC 4.43, interesting. Uh, what that would do was it would play back a tape. The, the, a, lot of, a lot of TVs were modified. There are PAL TVs that were modified to. to uh, receive an NTSC signal and uh, the, the PAL color frequency is 4.43 versus NTSC is 3.58 so basically what it did was it played back an NTSC signal as an NTSC signal but it used the the subcarrier of 4.43 so just a different conversion instead of converting the the 629 kilohertz uh, down converted color to 3.58 or 3.579545 if you want to be exact it would convert it to 4.43 and that was NTSC 4.43 this is just a little chart anyway there it is see output through NTSC PAL CCAM PAL M and PAL N we used to make a lot of money doing conversions I did conversions for many many years and uh, as, as I was starting with my story about these cheap Iowa machines <clears throat> which I happen to have one. I don't know if I showed it off or not, but I have one. Um, I, sh I can still use it, but I don't use the converter that's built into it because it looks like crap. I have a standalone converter that will convert PAL to NTSC and it will convert an NTSC signal to PAL and I can record it 
on this little Iowa. And the, the recorder works fine as a multi-system. It's just the built-in uh, built conversion leaves a lot to be desired. But, um, yeah, we used to get good money for it, but the price dropped so quickly. I had so much competition that uh, we were cutting each other's throats. We were getting like $10 to uh, convert tapes from Europe to, to North America and vice versa. So it became to the point where it was really not, not really worth it to do it. And of course the market has since completely evaporated. I think it's probably been two years since I had a, a single, maybe longer, three years maybe even longer than that since I had a, a PAL tape that someone it, it's been forever I keep my machine just for the odd tape that I might that somebody might bring me that they you know that they have sitting around for years and they haven't had it uh, they haven't had it converted and they want to put it on their uh, they want to put it on their computer so I keep the machine for that and I'm sure that the guy that owns this that's what they're using this for it's it's a, it's a company this won't come from a company but uh, I can't see them getting that much business for uh, con international conversions just because nobody's using tape anymore. Anyway, that's enough on this one. This one's done. Thanks for watching.